You know, in the last few weeks, we've been talking about walls, and we've been talking about the walls, the Jericho that were tore down, you know, to get at the enemy, and then we talked about invisible walls that the enemy used to attack us and what needs to be tore down. And we've talked about all these different types of walls, and then we talked about distraction. But if when if you look at that, if we talk about walls, I think not only their walls are being tore down, but the devil has tore down some of our walls that are our protection. And this brings us to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, I, I've been studying Nehemiah, and it's just seemed like more and more I study, the more and more I get out of it. And uh, it'd be Nehemiah 1. We're going to start at Nehemiah 1. And uh, it, when we look at the word, the name Nehemiah, Nehemiah means Jehovah comforts. Jehovah comforts. And I thought that was kind of a neat name. You know, in, in the Bible, a lot of names have certain relevancy. But here it says, Nehemiah stands for Jehovah Comforts. Now, to let you know a little bit about Nehemiah, he, he was actually still in captivity. He was still in captivity, and he, was, he had a royal position as a cupbearer for the king. And the cupbearer, you have to understand what a cupbearer was. They were the ones that served the king their drinks, and they would have to taste it to make sure there wasn't any poison in it. So, you know, that sounds like a good royal job, but, you know, hey, it's also had death inclined to it, but it was like the protection of the king. So Nehemiah was the royal cup thing, even though he was still in captivity. Well, I want to start on verse 2, because uh, I stumbled around all those other names in verse 1. So I'm going to go in verse 2 and hope I do well on that. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 2, it says, now, Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, and he and certain men of Judah, I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning is Jerusalem. So you see there were people that were able to escape out of the captivity of the king there. They were able to go to Jerusalem, and, and he asked, and a lot of translation says it was his brother that he asked, but he asked, how, how is the people in Jerusalem? And so he goes in here, and they said unto me, this is Nehemiah talking, <coughs> the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates there are, are burned with fire. Now, here he was, he was still in captivity, and he saw that the hope of people escaping were going to be able to live a productive life, so forth. But then he gets this word that, hey, Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem are torn down. And the gates are set on fire. So his response was this. Verse 4. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept. And mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now we see this here. All of us had, and we can even do this parallel to our nation of what's going on in our nation. You know, there's such upheaval. There's actually fires going on in our nation. There's a lot of disruption. Uh, a lot of people would like us to go into captivity 
Uh, that's one of the main goals that they have is that we will be under the government's rule completely. You know, these are the type of things that they were going through is they were under the government's rule here. But see, here he, he thought, here are these people got set free. And so they have new hope and everything. Then he finds out. You know, they they were just hurting. They were, and he was so broken. He was so broken for the people, and he had such a burden for the city. And he said that he got to the point of tears that he wept over. Now, how many times have we got to the point as a body of believers in ourselves that we wept for our nation? That how many times have we wept for other people? You know, until the people get to the point that you get so burdened and then that he was so burdened he did that he mourned it. That we got you know, mourning is just not grieving. We can kind of grieve and this and this, but mourning is when you're totally there's nothing that you can do about it. And that's when you have to rely, rely on the Lord. Now, this is almost like, I, I always do this teaching, that it talks about, blessed are those that mourn, they shall be comforted. Well, you know, a lot of people, they have lost loved ones, and I've ran into people that they've lost loved ones and they grieve the rest of their life. They just grieve and grieve and grieve. But when you get to the point of mourning, you there's nothing that you feel like you can do about it. You know, when you're grieving, sometimes you'll say, I wish I could have, should have. And here we see that he's at the point, there's nothing I can do. Only thing he can do is rely on God. And that's when with grieving with us as individuals, we have to, you can grieve and grieve the rest of your life, but until you get to the place of mourning, you will not be comforted until you release it all over to God. And see, that's the thing here. That's why his name is Jehovah Comfort. That's the reason why Nehemiah was known as Jehovah Comfort. And so we see that God comforts him, comforts him with the heartache and the weeping for the nation of Israel at that time. The Jewish people that were hurting, the people that it was able to escape under the bondage of the king went to Jerusalem, set up Jerusalem, but then Jerusalem the devil tore the walls down. Now, it said that he said for certain days he fasted and prayed. Amen. You know, the reason why he fasted and prayed is because he had that burden. Mm -hmm. He had that burden. Until we, as believers, get a burden for lost souls, yeah, right. get a burden for our country, we just stay in the grief mode. And we got to get to the point that we take and get that burden. And when you get to the place of mourning, then you seek God and he will comfort us. We go on and we look at what he did. He, he started in his prayer and he says here, Nevi 1.5 says, And I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, so in his morning, he knew who to call on to. Amen. A lot of times when you are grieving, we do not know who to call on. We are so much how it is hurting us and how much we miss somebody are grieving because what we don't have or what we have lost. And it's not always, it is not always loss of a loved one. Now, years ago, uh, I've shared this. 
is that have you ever seen a person that came to Christ and this person was so gung-ho for the Lord? Man, they had so much joy for the Lord. And they went out and they every time they came to somebody, they witnessed and they studied and they were, everybody looked at them because they had this such enthusiasm about salvation in Christ. And then a year later, they fell back into sin worse than they were before. How many of you have seen people like that? Well, the point is, they get, they have never, they stay in grief in their sin. That they, that they have never mourned their sin and said it's dead. And there's nothing you can do about it except ask God for your forgiveness. That's the reason why they fall back into it. It's because, you know, I kind of miss doing that. I had some joy from doing that. I kind of see, see, they get into that grief. And they, they're just grieving that for their old lifestyle. They wish they could again. And so what happens? They fall right back into it. So we see that until a person gets to the place of mourning, get in a place of mourning their sin and say, I am dead, then God is able to comfort them. So we go on here. And it says, and he was talking here and praying. He says, I said, I beseech thee, O God, of heaven, the great and terrible God. I don't like that word terrible, but it means the awesome God. That keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thy ear now be attentive. And their eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant. We see, what was he doing here? He was praying for himself. He saw the big picture where the Jewish people and Jerusalem walls were down, and they needed to be rebuilt. But what did he do first? He prayed for himself to get himself right with God. And that's the way we have to look at our nation or look at our churches and look at everything. We need to look at ourselves to pray, Lord, reveal to me, forgive me, and let me go forward. Which I pray thee now. He didn't say, well, I'm going to confess later. He said, now. He was earnest about that right now. Right now. And that's why I'm going to say right now that every person needs to get real with God right now. And Lord, reveal things into your heart so I may confess it. I told you that I've been, Brit has gone to Florida and the Lord's revealing some things in me that I don't like and I have to pray about it. That's right. And so this is a time that the Lord is just doing a work in me. Lord. Now hope I don't come to churches with bruises. Now I just hope that doesn't come. But sometimes it does. But we see that we see that it goes on that he prays earnestly. What did it say? How often did he pray? Day and night. He just didn't get up and say, Good morning, Lord. This is it. I'm going to say my five minute prayer. You get me through the day. Don't make my day rough. You know, just be with me. He was so earnestly praying. No, it's all right to say, Lord, direct my path today. But he was so earnest about it that I, he prayed day and night and he prayed without ceasing. And, you know, you don't have to go around and just say, just pray all day. Everywhere you go, it could be a prayer. You don't have to 
fall down on your face everywhere. But sometimes that's good. When you get so to the point, so much burden, you will get before your face before God. To humble yourself before the hand of God. But then it goes on and he says day and night. And then what else did he do next? He prayed for the children of Israel, the servants. He prayed for the other people. Prayed for himself. Prayed for the people, the chosen people of God. He prayed for them. And he confessed. It says he confessed the sins of the children of Israel. He might not have done these things, but the reason why the walls were broken down is because of sin. They rejected God again. They were not keeping the commandments of God. So that just opened the doorway for Satan to come in and do a work on. So we go on and we look at it, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. Now, we look at this, that he was not only saying that he has sinned, but he's also saying the past generations have sinned also. You know, it goes back that when the people asked for a king, They got Saul. Saul couldn't handle it. But then then God ordained David. David did a lot of bad things and things. He wasn't perfect. But he was actually looking for God's heart. But we see that David's son, Solomon, he was one that rebuilt the temple. He was the richest man that ever was and ever will be. But God did a stipulation to him. Do not marry foreign women. He had 300 wives and 700 concubines. That was the one thing God told him not to do. Because God knew that when he, these women would come in and they would start serving other gods. So that became the downfall of Israel again, the Jewish people. So that is the thing that he says, I confess the sins of the Israeli people and the confessions. And that's the reason why we need to pray that the remnants of the sins and the atrocities of our nation. That's we, with us, need to humble ourselves, first confess for ourselves, but we need to pray for our nation and the atrocities and sins that they have committed. And that's a prayer of remittance. And so we go on, and it goes on. He says, we've dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept your commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou hast commanded thy servant Moses. See, this is the thing that we have to understand. At that particular time, when this was happened, the people of Israel were serving other gods, and one of the gods they served was Molech. And Molech was the one that they would Sacrifice babies. Does that sound familiar to you now? What is our country doing? Sacrificing babies through abortion. So we need to pray salvation. We need to pray and confess the sins and remit it and stand in the gap for our nation for the atrocities that is happening. That's the duty of the church. That's what we need to do, and we're going to have to get serious. We need to be to the point, 
Sometimes we need to just be totally broken so we'll get into mourning for our country and go to God because he's the only one who can fix it. So we go on. It says, the commandments, we have dealt corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor judgments without commanding thy servant Moses. Verse 8, remember I beseech thee the word that thou com commandest the servant Moses, saying, if we transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. That's what happened. Yeah. That's what happened. The people were scattered. Yeah. They were no longer under the, the umbrella. They were no longer under the pillar of fire. They're no longer of the cloud. They just walked out from under it. Because they loved the sin more than the Father. And we need to get that in our mind. Do we love sin more than we do Father, the Father God that forgives us from all of our trespasses? We used to be known as a Christian nation. What did I say? Used to be. And we need to come to morning and pray for what the founding fathers you know, they're all trying to say, well, it was slavery and all this, that the Constitution was, they, all of them were slave owners. You know, they, they, but they, those men were God-fearing men. And they based the Constitution on godly principles. So we have to understand we need to pray for our nation. Verse 9. But if we turn unto thee, Listen, Nehemiah speaking again. If you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though you were cast out to the uttermost part of heaven, yet I will gather them from thence and bring them into a place I've chosen to set my name there. Verse 10. And now... These are the servants of thy people whom thou hast redeemed by the great power and by thy strong hand. Then verse 11. O Lord, I beseech thee. Lord, that means, Lord, I seek you. Lord, I seek you. Let now thy ear and be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. He's praying for himself. Praying for himself. And the prayer of thy servants. He's praying for the Jewish people, the Israelis, who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day himself, grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cup bearer. He prayed this for what's going to be the next step that God had. Which we'll go on to a later time. But we have to understand, first of all, when he saw something or heard something that broke his heart of the nation of Israel, that he wept. And he went into mourning for that because Jehovah comforts. And then he prayed for himself. Then he prayed for his nation. Then he prayed for the sins of his forefathers. Who brought the destruction to Jerusalem. And the point is. When he prayed. He prayed day and night. His heart. 
was so overwhelmed. So overwhelmed. So we have to understand. What we need to do. Are we just grieving for our nation? Or are we mourning for our nation? So that God will comfort us. And show us the direction that we should go. You know, that's what it's all about. We can go out and get people to get out and go vote, which is good. We need to do that. We need to speak truth to people. That's it. But it goes, first of all, that we need to pray that we are right with God. That we confess the sins of our forefathers and pray for our nation also. That's what it's all about, people. And when you think of Nehemiah, think of what it says, his name. Jehovah comforts. And all of us need, in this time, what we see, we can be fearful. We can be this, but we need to get to the point and say, God, comfort us. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you right now. Father, as Nehemiah mourned, over his nation. Let us get to the point in our lives that we mourn for our nation so God will comfort us. And Father, that we pray for ourselves that anything that's in us individually that's keeping us from going forward, reveal it in us so there will not be any barrier between us. Father, we pray for the sins of our forefathers. We pray for our leaders. We pray right now in the name of Jesus that this nation will know the truth and the truth will set them free. And all the lies that are going out we reveal as lies. And people will see that truth and they'll be set free. Father, we pray right now. Remittance of the atrocities and the sins of our forefathers. We say, heal us, heal our nation, heal our families. Father, we speak this. And Father, just be it with us. And comfort us. Because she said, blessed are those that mourn, that she be comforted. Father, just as the name Nehemiah says, Jehovah comforts. And thank you, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, and God Almighty, that you are comforted during all this time. And through this destruction that the devil wants to do, that wants to tear down these walls, that, Father, that you'll give us strength to be the builders. In Jesus' name, amen.